and folks, continuing along with our lecture material. Um, so we're going to shift away a little bit from uh, solving problems in kinetics and working through those word problems and getting kind of more into a theoretical kind of fundamental aspect of kinetics. Um, and so that is the collision model of chemical reactions. Okay, so in this collision model, so this is built on the simple idea that molecules must collide to react. Um, so hopefully that um, is pretty obvious. If not, this is a good first place to start. Molecule A has to find molecule B. They have to, right, diffuse, collide, react. So A, um, so that's the simplest idea of the collision model. So a diffusion limited reaction is what we call the fastest possible reaction. And I'm going to introduce this concept called rate limiting step or even rate determining step. And our what we're going to see now is chemistry actually occurs in steps. We've kind of been lying to you up to now showing you these beautiful simple reactions. As it turns out, chemical reactions are not so simple. They have what's called a mechanism, which is multiple steps, and, and that's coming in the next videos. So if we have a diffusion limited reaction, this is the fastest possible reaction, and the rate limiting step is the time it takes for molecules to diffuse and collide. Okay. So the example I like to make of this is, um, suppose you have a super fast car. Maybe you have like a Tesla, right? Um, and you want to drive from Eureka down to the Bay Area. Well, um, other than having to stop and charge, which would be one of your rate determining steps, right? The fastest that you could drive is going to be based on traffic. It's not really based on how fast your car can go, perhaps in some areas where there's no traffic. But if you're on the 101 and it's a two lane road and you can't pass anybody and you're behind a big truck, it doesn't matter how fast your car can go. You can only go as fast as that step will allow you. So that's one thing we start to think about with these, um, with the collision model is we have like the fastest possible reaction, which would be this diffusion limited. In other words, the instant the molecules collide, they react. But there might be some other steps in there. So the molecules might collide and they have to like flirt around a little bit and dance around in order to find the sweet spot. Um, and that would take up some time. Okay. So factors that can affect um, reaction rates. So we've talked about concentration and reaction order. We've talked about that a whole bunch. And of course, that's super important. But if we want to get even more fundamental, factors that affect um, reaction rates, definitely temperature. So as we increase temperature, we increase the kinetic energy of molecules, and thus we increase the number of collisions. So as our molecules are getting hotter, they're moving around faster, they're more likely to collide, which would owe to a faster reaction. There's this thing called activation energy, which is the minimum energy of a molecular collision required to break a bond in a reactant and go on to form products. So it takes energy to break a chemical bond. Um, and oftentimes we need some extra energy in order for that to happen. And that can be realized in this activation energy from a molecule colliding. So perhaps in some instances, the molecules collide with enough energy to overcome this activation energy. And so, of course, the higher our temperature is, the more likely our molecules will be able to overcome this activation energy. And then finally, steric orientation. Um, this is when molecules collide in a way that leads to a successful collision. And I've got um, a few pictures of that coming up. Okay. Um, so here we get to the famous Arrhenius equation. Um, and so this is a, an actual equation. So this is a theoretical way of calculating a rate constant. So we've talked up to now about how kinetics is an experimental science. Um, and you often just have to do the reaction and measure the rates of reactants over time. Um, well, there are theoretical approaches to this. 
And one of these is given by the Arrhenius equation, which states the rate constant K equals this collision frequency factor, this A term, um, times the exponential. So the exponential, that's my shorthand notation for E. So natural number E. So when I write exponential of negative EA divided by RT, that's the same thing as saying E raised to the power EA over RT. So that's what all of that stuff means, okay? So EA is our activation energy. Activation energies are always positive, even though there's a negative sign in the equation, okay? Um, R, that's our gas constant, and that's the 8.314 joule per mole per K flavor. So that means our activation energy is in joules per mole, but you'll often see it given as kilojoules per mole. So you have to do a little bit of unit conversion um, to get both of them in joules per mole. And of course, temperature in Kelvin. Um, so when we view this activation energy, the way that this works, um, we can imagine the start of our reaction where we're starting at our reactants and the reactants have some amount of internal energy as they always will. And our products have some amount of internal energy. And what we notice here, if we just look at the difference between those two, so I'm going to extend this line down here, okay, this difference between these two would actually be the enthalpy of the reaction, so the delta H. Um, and as you can see here, this delta H would be negative. So this would be an example of an exothermic reaction because at the starting point, the reactants are here. At the final point, the products are here. So at the end of the day, the products are lower in energy than reactants. That would be an exothermic reaction. However, you notice now to get to that point, they have to go over this hill. This is our activation energy. And this point that I'm circling right here, that's what we call a high energy transition state or an activated complex. And that is some like temporary, very weird looking intermediate where the reactant molecule and the product molecule are kind of like half formed right they're in development process um, and so that's the high energy side if they collide with enough energy to overcome that barrier then it'll move on down through into products okay so oftentimes our molecules need to be oriented in a special way in order to react so here's one example of that okay so um, O3 and NO react to form O2 and NO2. And this is a very simple one-step reaction. Um, and so if you look at this here and you look at our final products, what we notice is that um, one of our oxygen bonds, so this is, I'm just going to draw a very um, abbreviated version of the Lewis structure here. So you can see what we need to do is create a new oxygen nitrogen bond um, because in our final reactants, right, we have an OO and an ONO. Um, I know these aren't the complete Lewis structures, but just bear with me here. So we really need this ozone to collide with NO in this way that will lead to a successful reaction. So for example, here you can see the nitrogen is in blue and it's oriented in the correct way. This is our activated complex, so this weird thing where for this brief temporary moment, um, the O3 and the NO are kind of all bonded together. So that would be at the very top of this barrier right here. Um, and then they can finally go on to form products. Okay. So if let's suppose they were to collide in this orientation with an oxygen and an oxygen colliding, that would be an ineffective collision which would not result in a reaction. And certainly the more of those types of ineffective collisions we have, the longer our reaction would take. So with respect to steric orientation, generally when we have very small molecules like O3 and NO, they're gonna find that sweet spot quite easily because the molecules are very small. Um, and so that means um, for very small molecules, 
Um, they typically have a small activation energy um, because they're able to find that sweet spot easily. A small EA means a large K, which means the reaction proceeds quickly. Um, however, if we were looking at big molecules, things like biological, like proteins, or things like DNA, right, big humongous molecules, those can react very slow. Um, because oftentimes those sweet spots, you know, finding the right collision in a big molecule can be much harder. Um, so it's not always true, but it's kind of generally true that small molecules will react faster than big molecules because of the steric orientation. Um, and then finally, if we think about what's going on here now, so we're looking at the progress of the reaction going this way. What if we wanted to drive this reaction in reverse? Okay. Well, you can see in the forward direction, it's exothermic. But in the reverse direction, it's endothermic. And so this reaction is not going to want to go um, in the reverse direction very easily. And this is what gives us equilibrium positions, right? If this was an equilibrium reaction, we could imagine this would be a reaction that would favor the formation of products because that has a small activation energy and a large exothermicity, okay? Um, so let's see. Uh, so um, 